nothing else to do. <laughs> We're reaching a new depth. <laughs> Hi. Hello. We have summer now. We reached summer during our isolation. <laughs> yes, we did. So we have the air conditioning on. It might be a little louder than normal. But I also, before we start, I wanted to share something that Jeffrey and I did. We made a commercial for Facebook, mm, that's uh, right. uh, which was really lovely. We're going to give the proceeds of what we're getting to the Upper Valley Haven, where Jeffrey is a volunteer. Um, it's a food pantry and a homeless pantry. shelter. But I also wanted to say to Ray, because we're in the commercial, we are, we're, oh, there it is. Oh, there it is. Oh, the commercial? Over here. It's oh, on. Look at that. <laughs> oh. So we're in the commercial, and you see us here, and you don't see Ray. I just wanted to thank Ray, because in that process of doing that commercial, he had to be on the other end while people were, were directing us and doing technology on the other end. He spent hours and hours yeah. on the technological side just getting everything together so that they could film remotely and then he ends up operating the camera and he does that for us every time we do the show too so he does the sound he has to listen to it blah 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 he finds the great shots of the food and thank you ray i just wanted to give yeah. you Same here, a ray. shout out raymo you're That's the best nice. yeah great I don't do it for the uh, glory i just <laughs> You do it for the money, right? <laughs> you do it for the glory. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that oh, was just look. a shout out to Ramo. Yeah. But okay, so today I'm making semolina bread, which is just about to go in the oven. And Gazina? I'm going to be making what's called a Vinbeuteltorte, which is, that's German. Stop showing off. Yeah. <laughs> but it is, a Vinbeutel in German is cream puff, which means windbag, which I think is hysterical. That's cute. And so what they do is they'll take filled cream puffs and they will hide them in the mousse in a cake. Mm -hmm. So I'm taking, I'm doing a little bit of a mashup of a Fraser. I'm putting strawberries on the side, Vinbeutel in the middle, tasty all around. But let's get to you first. All right. As we usually do, we'll be doing things a little out of order with the bread. We'll be loading first, then doing a mix. Uh, but if you click on the links, you will be able to follow the recipe. So click on that lovely Durham sesame recipe. Another thing to note about this bread is that uh, it was mixed yesterday. So it's actually a day and a half ago in the evening. Tuesday evening, I made the liquid levam. Wednesday, I mixed the dough, gave it three hours of bulk fermentation, and shaped it and refrigerated it overnight. It spreads out the workload, which can be very favorable. It also is an opportunity for more flavor to develop in the bread. So it can be a nice way to do things. It does require uh, forethought because now you have to think, oh, I need to have an adequate weight of liquid levain on Tuesday so that I can make the levain and then Wednesday the final dough, etc. Yeah. So here we have it. Uh, these weigh 700 grams each. And when I feel them, I can get a sense that they've got a nice interior lightness. They could rise some more, but we're on a bit of a schedule, and I think they'll be okay. They'll come up in the oven. And I'm going to load them into cast irons, which have been preheating for about an hour. Uh, we've got these two, and then here I made, just for fun, some breadsticks. And so we'll put them in the oven. I think after the initial push, after the initial 15 or so minutes, We'll put these in the oven. All right? So we're loading first. Then, then we're going to start the mix. And then he's going to show you all the glorious things of shaping. OK. So we're going to take one at a time the cast irons from the oven, put it here, transfer the breads onto paper, which will then very easily slide into the base portion of the. Do you have your towels for, can you grab your towels so we actually don't burn our paws off? That would be very helpful. And I also have a mitt okay. for extra protection. I think you'll have to double up for that. So what do you want to take out first? Um, let's take out, we're going to do the rounds first. Rounds first. You, I also like to think of things in the following way. They all weigh 700 grams, but a, you can close that now. Okay. A 700 gram round loaf is going to take longer to bake than an oval loaf simply because of the shape. So by putting the round ones in first, I can be confident they'll more or less all be done at the same time. Yep. So from here, you can tell the good side is up. So I'm going to invert this into my hand and then onto this paper. And then I will 
give it a simple score, and you can get as elaborate as you want. And you're just using a knife right now? I'm using a really, it's a Victorian X that some Japanese baker gave me, and it's wonderfully sharp. It's slightly serrated. It's really sharp. And I would say that is a little more than a half of an inch deep. Yeah, and you'll want to, to some extent, base the depth on the amount of rise. Can you put that here? If you like. So if the bread is slightly under-risen, go ahead a little bit deeper on your cutting to give more room for expansion. Ah, that's right. If a your bread's a little bit over-risen, slightly shallow. less. Could you do that? Yes. Thank you. So you want to put that on top? Yeah. Is that deep enough? Yeah, it is. Okay. Uh, and if you want to know the type of pans that Jeffrey's using for this, they're not specialty bread pans. These are actually lodge pans, cast iron. So you look for the ones that don't have the handles on the top so that they can lie flat. So it's a skillet in a Dutch oven that actually come together. And what's wonderful about them is that they actually seal correctly. They don't have any gaps, so they really create that steam environment. And what's very wonderful about them is that I'm not dropping the loaf into here, which right. is the case with most cast iron. In this case, it's simply a, a gentle. Right? <clears throat> and now the hopper. Now this Dragundo <clears throat> guy. It's the monster. This that weighs 26 monster. pounds. 26 pounds. 26 yeah. pounds of heat right it's now. It's a lot of mass. In fact. It's possible that you have too much mass, which would mean your bread might be susceptible to getting too dark on the bottom. If after 20 minutes or so, you pull out, you take off the lid, and it yeah. looks as though there's too much color on the bottom, then you could transfer the bread to a sheet pan. I just put it on the, I just take, a, take it out put it right and on the put rack. it right on the rack yeah. because yeah. it's not going to be going anywhere. Okay, I'm going to have an angled blade here. I'm going to go from here to here. That's all. Straight line. I think what's confusing for some people, they will see the bread after it's baked. Yeah, baked, it's got and that And because nice, it has lovely the ear curve. and it looks like it's off to the side, same with baguettes. They, yep. they assume either it's slanted in a way or it's off to the side, but it's not. It's just the way the bread grows and you get this lovely ear and then you get the opening as it grows. And it's very, very hard to be accurate if you're trying to make these curved cuts, particularly right. if you're loading, you know, 100 loaves of bread in the oven. Well, especially if you're trying to deal with 26 pounds of cast iron heat. All okay. right. 26 pounds and 700 grams. Yeah. Got it. Well done. There. Okay. Okay, so, so now loaded. Now we're off to the races of the mix. Yeah, so now we're going to begin hand mixing. I said last week, if you had seen the program, that I wanted to do some hand mixing. A, because a lot of people, that's what they have access to, their hands in a bowl. B, because it can be very, very satisfying in a tactile sense to have a, a really direct connection. When I hand mix, I usually spread the mix out over the course of two or three hours. I'm going to use this beautiful bread bowl. It's an old New England bread trough that's who knows how many years old. It's definitely old. And with this kind of thing, I'm not going to try to mix it to optimum gluten development all in one go. I prefer to do it over the course of two or three hours and gradually see the evolution of the dough. I have to say, having baked professionally for decades, it's really interesting and really enjoyable to be now doing baking on a much smaller scale and I've been thrilled to be hand mixing this week because after I received this from my wife for my birthday I stopped mixing with a machine I only mixed with this but for the past year and a half I've been involved in a baking project that's in, required me to do a lot of, of mixing yeah. and I needed a little bit more of the kind of predictability of a stand mixer. So I haven't used this until last week. I haven't used it in like two years and it's so great to be back to it. So here's liquid Levan that I mixed yesterday. It's got some nice bubbles on it. It was more bubbly but driving here things always change because of the roads. Okay. 
Okay. And let's talk about the flower. You have both yeah. the unbleached all-purpose and durum. This is 60% durum, which gives it lovely, lovely yellowish golden hue and 40% all-purpose. It's a nice blend. You can go 50-50, you can go 70-30. It's really up to you. I've also got in here, and this is worth <coughs> noting, toasted sesame seeds. And if you want to have seeds in the dough, if you want to maximize the flavor of the seeds, you'll toast them. If you just want the seeds to provide texture, no need to toast them. Just add them in and you'll get like sunflower seeds untoasted will give you a completely different flavor than un sunflower seeds toasted. So here, it's sesame seeds toasted. You notice there were seeds on the surface of the loaves when I loaded them. Those seeds were untoasted. If I put toasted seeds on the outside of the loaf, they're obviously going to scorch and it's going to really wreck your dough. And All that's right. optional, too, for if you just want to have totally. them on the inside, keep them on the inside, or don't put them outside, or do both. Right, or not have any at all. Yeah. It's totally up to you. Now I'm simply gathering this together, giving it some strokes, hydrating the flour. I imagine this trough was multi-purpose. I imagine there were more than one infant had a bath in here. <laughs> <laughs> it certainly looks perfect, doesn't it? I also should say that I've added a bit more water than the recipe calls for. The recipe that I submitted was for 68% hydration. And I did that because I think a lot of the people who are watching the program, they're somewhat new to baking. And to start out with wettish doughs might feel a little bit too challenging. Um, it's not that there's any virtue in water for water's sake. And it is kind of macho these days for people to add extra water just to show how virile they are. Um, but in fact, the appropriate amount of water gives the flour the opportunity to truly express itself. So by adding a little more water, maybe the flour is going to metabolize a little more flavor and the results might be better. I might have a more open crumb, I might have a nicer eating texture, I might have a little more flavor. So this is all I do. Now I'll just cover it, let it sit for 30 minutes, Give it another fold. I do this for th three hours for a dough like this. There's no commercial yeast, so it's a gradual, naturally leavened development. Um, yeah, so if you're working on your sourdough, it, your culture, this is a fantastic recipe. And uh, I also wanted to address, because it may be hard to find the golden durum that is very fine, if someone can only find semolina that is a little grittier, uh, how would they go about making this bread? Would they need more water? You might need more water because it might have more absorption. So you'll just be very attentive to it. Um, and texturally, will there be a difference as well? It, it shouldn't be after three hours. I would think right. it would soften adequately. Yeah. So it would be a fine substitute. You know, don't go crazy trying to find ingredients that you can't find. If you've got things at hand that are going to be suitable, use those. Oftentimes, over the years, when I've mixed before I had this trough, I'd mix in a big bowl and it's like, what, now every 30 minutes I have to fold it? So for some people that might feel like, I can't commit to that. More than once, I'd say, all right, I gotta go to the post office and check the mail. They don't deliver it to our house where we live. So, okay, oh, I better take the dough because yeah. I'm gonna have to give it a fold on the way there. Okay, <laughs> Gazina, take it. Your little baby. So if you have been following the show, I've been making different things along the way, obviously, and I thought it would be really fun to combine some of the things we've learned into one of my favorite cakes. It is German. I am half. Half of me is German. Uh, I just like saying things like Winbeuteltorte because it's just really fun. You like saying the words. I just Come like on. saying the words. But I also love how Germans, when they choose words like windbag, love it. That's their, <laughs> that's their puff. What I also did is I stole from a cake called the Fraser. And that is a, straw, a French strawberry cake where you line the sides of your cake pan with cut strawberries. I wanted to first talk though about some of the things that I'm using and to show you some hacks and tips and tricks of building taller cakes when you do not have the implements that a professional pastry chef would have. So I here have a, a springform pan in lieu of a cake ring. This is what traditionally, how you would be making 
things like mousse cakes or a Fraser. So you could put this on a cake round and then lift it off. Um, because if you imagine you're making something that's really delicate inside, if you just build this in a traditional cake pan with a bottom, tipping up upside down to get it out can really shift things and make it look unsightly. So a pastry chef would use this, but if you have a spring form, that's the perfect thing to use. Then I also have acetate around the inside. So not everyone has a spring form as tall as this. Most people do have a spring form. So if you have parchment or acetate, which is a little more unusual, but parchment works perfectly, you can line this after you've baked your cake so that you can build it a little higher, so that you get that mousse as high as you need it to be. And it's a great way, too, that when you release the cake, uh, you don't have to use a blow dryer first to heat it. You can just unclick it and then, ta-da, take off your acetate or your parchment. So what I did in this case is I baked my cake. This is the cake pan cake that I baked, I think, in episode four. I baked it in the spring form. When it was cool, I took off the sides. I leveled the cake so it was about three quarters of an inch thick. Then I slipped it onto an eight inch cake cake um, uh, circle, haha, <laughs> like a pizza circle. Brain, hello. So that once it was done, I wouldn't have to serve it on the bottom of the spring form. I could just pick it right up. Then I lined this and now it's ready to go. I cut my strawberries in half and I hold them as well. And you can just line this with them all top side down like that, but I like to alternate as well. So I'll alternate these guys all the way around. Be careful that they don't fall over. You want to make sure that they are, they're nestled up against the side. So should you just lick each one? Is that the way you prevent it from falling over? That could be a way. That could be a way. But the nice thing about the acetate, it, it, it holds on rather well. Oh, OK. What I end up doing, too, is that I freeze this for a bit. See? Don't get confused. I freeze this for a bit for the mousse to set. And so what can happen if you leave this overnight, which is totally fine, your, hey, who's not paying attention? Me. What you can do is because the fruit gets frozen and that can look unsightly, have a little strawberry, extra strawberry jam on hand to brush the outside of the strawberry just to take away any of, um, because sometimes freezing them makes a little, them mm. look a little anemic. So just give it a little brush and they'll look fantastic. And then you just go all the way around. This is about 12 strawberries, could take 13. And then you also want a few extra so that you have decor for the top. I always look for the perfectly shaped strawberry so that once they go around, they all look like this. Sometimes you will see a strawberry that is um, a little longer. You know, they have, they grow like this. But if you look at the sides of them, if you cut them perfectly, it will look as if it was that perfectly mm -hmm. cylindrical sure. strawberry. So you can still use those. You just have to use your noggin. Now, question. Yeah. The French version of this cake, which I always call fraise, since yeah. fraise, fraise is the French word for yeah. strawberry. Strawberry. Uh, that's the one that traditionally they topped with corny light green marzipan, right? Marzipan, sometimes they use a glaze as well. Yeah. So you could do either ways, but I prefer the marzipan because. Because you're I'm, German. Because I'm German. It is such a German thing. Uh, and I turn this upside down, and I always tend to have two that end up in the same position. So these two, because I can't fit another one in, are both up. But I kind of love that because it's that perfect imperfection. Like the Amish always want one thing yeah. a little off. Yeah. So I love that. Now I have my filled cream puffs. And these cream puffs are, and if you look at the description, you will be able to find that recipe for the pastry cream. And I'm using that pastry cream in two ways. I am filled these cream puffs, which we did last week with that strawberry pastry cream. And I, notice how I'm, I'm laying them. I'll show you one that's unfilled so you can see what I'm doing and why I'm doing it this way. You stay, you stay. It didn't stay. I'll give you another one. And we'll do one more. Make it stay, you stay. See, be careful, everything, you stay. You get back up there. Boop. My fingers have to be always on the on guard. So if I had 
put the cream puffs in like this, how you naturally would think to do it. When you cut into it, what it will be is a semicircle. If you lay them like this, when you cut into it, if you cut it perfectly, sometimes you don't get the perfect cut, you'll get a perfect round as opposed to the semicircle. So that's why I lay them like this. So that as you're cutting slices, what you'll do is you'll cut into it and see this beautiful round of puff mm -hmm. because it isn't going to grow cylindrically mm -hmm. that. So I, so I put them that way. And then now I have my lightened chocolate pastry cream. And I use a little gelatin as well just to make sure that it sets. And I have it in a pastry bag fitted with an open tip so I can get in between things so that there are no gaps. Always important. All these little spaces. And keep an eye on those little strawberries because they like to tip over just as you're getting to work. And you don't want that to happen. And now you can see that if you have only a more shallow spring form, like as I go around here, how important it is to do little extras like putting parchment up and around the side so that you have enough room to cover those puffs entirely and still have straight sides. Now that I've gotten in the edges, I can just start plopping it on Oops, willy-nilly. And now I'm going to smooth that out all the way around. Once I've smoothed that out, I also freeze and I let it set for at least two hours or overnight so that when you cut into it, it actually keeps its shape. If you freeze this overnight before you serve it, put it in the fridge for an hour or two uh, so that you can actually slice it. Otherwise, it'll be frozen solid. That's always important because that's when you tend to hurt yourself when things are frozen solid. I wanted to show you one more thing because gelatin can be intimidating for people. Do you use sheet or powdered? I use sheet, but the recipe I gave the instructions for powdered. for powdered. So what you have to do first is you soften. Some people call it blooming, but blooming isn't the softening. Bloom, when you refer to gelatin, refers to its efficacy. How strong is it? What's its holding powder? That's its bloom. And what you would traditionally do is have a shallow bowl and you would sprinkle that gelatin on to soften it. And then with the powdered stuff, you'd have to heat it up before you put it in. Now this is leaf gelatin. This is what pastry chefs use. And it, it seems very intimidating, I think mainly because it's not very well seen. But one thing that's great about the sheet gelatin is that you're not adding extra liquid. If you're using powdered, you have to add the liquid you have to in add the which liquid. you what dissolve you, it. What you do have to do is you have to submerge it in cold water, make sure it's cold, to soften it. And what I use is, it's called silver. When, if you go online to look for gelatin, it's the silver, and that refers to the bloom. All that means is silver is, is almost exactly the same setting power, powder, power as the powder gelatin you would get at the store. So two leaves of this are equivalent to one packet of plain gelatin. And once this is, oh, it's a brick. Gorgeous, gorgeous. <clears throat> it's smiling. That can go right back in like this, I'd say. So, so don't get confused. If you go and look for leaf gelatin, there's gold, there, bronze. Silver is what is the most equivalent to the traditional powder gelatin you'd get at the store. Knox, Knox brand, right? And what you do once you're ready, so if you have, in this case, you'd be putting it into the hot pastry cream for it to melt. All you have to do is you lift those leaves. Look at them. Look how soft they are now. This is what they look like. And you know how Jeffrey said you don't have to add that extra water? And you don't. You squeeze that extra water out. And you add this straight to whatever hot stuff you want to set. And you whisk. And it melts beautifully. That's the other reason I love this. People have trouble with the powdered gelatin because sometimes you don't soften it entirely. There can be little pills of the gelatin that aren't softened and they don't melt and dissolve into whatever you're doing. This always melts. And the mouthfeel is lovely. There's something about this that I like better than the powdered gelatin. The difference is, is that this is easier to work with. And you wouldn't think it is because the fancy pastry people use it. It's just harder to find because they don't sell it in the stores. So what you're gonna look for is leaf gelatin, silver, and it's two sheets are equivalent to one packet of 
the Knox gelatin that's powdered. And you just soften it, put it into the hot stuff, whisk it, it's perfect. So a couple things, acetate or parchment instead of using cake rings, leaf gelatin, and you'll be working like a pro. And now we're gonna go back that's to beautiful. you. beautiful. I love this wow. stuff. And make sure that you always soften it in cold water. If you soften it in hot water, then it's just going to dissolve. <laughs> then you'll just have like a pool of plain And if you overheat jelly. it when you melt it, then it's going to lose its it gelling loses, power. Well, it loses its efficacy. That's the other reason I like this better, too, than using powder. Because when you do have to heat the gelatin, people will often microwave the powder gelatin yeah. to get it melted. And you, if you over scorch it, it loses its efficacy. Yeah, if it gets stringy, it's gone. It's, it, it, it no longer has a holding power. So with, I've, without a fail, if you soften it this way, you make your pastry cream, you take it off the heat, you add your gelatin and whisk it in. There you go. It's perfect and so much easier than the powder. It's just harder to find, but you know, that's what the internet is for. So now, Jeffrey, are you going to shape your bread We're going now? to divide and shape. So here we are again doing a reverse chronology. So this is dough that Gazina mixed about three and a half hours ago. It feels really good. And so we're going to divide this into three loaves at 700 grams and I'll, I'll make about eight of those breadsticks. So what we'll do is we'll divide and pre-shape these. And then we'll go back to, I think, Gazina doing something. I'm not sure. Oh, that's way too big. I was thinking the other day about all the decades that I spent as a production baker and what an absolute joy it is to make hundreds of loaves of bread every day and how fulfilling it is. It's equally fulfilling to make three loaves of bread, I find. And I really, really love this phase since I'm not working full-time professionally. I love just being able to have this really rich, deep engagement with hand-mixed bread. And I guess I feel a little like uh, Marlon Brando in the tomatoes or something at this point. No, no, that's a bad analogy. Oh, it we is? We know what happened. Oh, OK. Orange slice, yeah, just don't put the orange slice in your mouth. So this is 700 grams this per. This is 700 per. There's those. I'll pre-shape these, and then I'll divide the breadsticks. So this is a nice fluid dough. It's nice texture. I'm keeping my hands dry. Look here at these bubbles these little surface bubbles, those are fermentation gases. These are the good guys. When you see those, that's an indication that your dough has been nicely fermented. And there, I don't know if you can pick them up, Ray, but they're very visible on the top surface. So that's always a good sign to, when you see that. So I'll slow down for this one. So I want a little flour here to start. I want my hands to be dry all the time, and that's all I need to do to ensure that they're dry. In case there's any big bubbles, I just go because I don't want to incorporate them into the final shaping. Otherwise, that would be a little too big when we slice our bread. The way I pre-shape is I fold it in half like that. Then I pick it up so that seam is north-south. And then I start this tucking. And then when it's more or less round, I'll give it a few more strokes. And this is the pre-shape? Yep, this isn't a final shape, so I don't have to go crazy. And in the pre-shape, you put it upside down. Well, this is interesting. <clears throat> Germans tend to put the seams up. Mm -hmm. French tend to put the seams down. I was trained to put the seams up, having started my life, baking life, working for a German woman. Now, looking at that, it's more than just because the border between France and Germany is so distinct and the way things happen is different. But there is a difference, too. So look at, look at it this way. If I leave the seams like this, since they're underneath, they're not going to be spreading as much as these. Right, yes. So this will stay much more cohesive. You can use this strategically in production. In other words, if I have loaf. to do, if, well, if I have to do 50 loaves yeah. and there's nobody helping me, I might want to, for efficiency, divide and pre-shape them all 
but I might want the first ones to be seams up so that the, as soon as I'm done with number 50, yeah, it's because the seams are up on the first 10 or 12, I can go right back. I don't have to wait. I won't have a gap of time. Right. These are little things that uh, bakers just naturally pick up from doing it and realizing that there's always, always ways to increase your efficiency. Um, I don't know. Society seems to divide work into either manual or cerebral, but I think the best work involves both to me anyway, yep. and baking really involves both. So now I'll do some 40 gram bread sticks. I'm going to get a real tool though to cut. Let's see. And again, if you're just joining us, Jeffrey's making uh, the golden durum with sesame bread with sa uh, naturally leavened. So if you've got your sourdough bubbling, this is what you want to make. Because I added extra water compared to what the recipe called for, I'll have more than eight of these. So I think I'm simply going to take and put the extra dough. I'll just eyeball it and add it to the, uh, these three loaves since one sheet pan comfortably holds eight breadsticks. Breadsticks are the width of the sheet pan. What's oh, a home so sheet convenient. pan? Yeah, and what's a home sheet pan for? Is it 12 or more? I can't remember. Uh, I think it is. Uh, well, I always thought it was 16, so that's how much I know. Is it 16 for the width on those? No, that's for a full size. So no? it is, you're right. It's like, it's like 11, 11 plus. Yeah. So yeah. it is 12 at the rim, but a little smaller on the interior. Okay, these will need five minutes to relax and then they can get their finished shaping. There's five minutes and a half on the timer. That would be a 30 minute bake. These will take longer than that, but yeah. that'll be a good time to check things. So, do you have something you can show? I can show the finish of the cake. I wanted to show you one more little trick for filling um, the cream puffs. You can use these little puppies. No mustard was in here, but say there was. You just have to clean it. You have to make sure that the hole is big enough that if you have a thicker uh, consistency of your pastry cream that it will come out more easily but not so big that you're creating too big a hole in your puff. But this is a fantastic way to control how much is going in. The other thing is that if you have a very thick pastry cream and you're filling say a cream puff without lightening it so it's more viscous, oftentimes if you're using a pastry tip in a bag as you are putting that pastry cream in, if you don't have a coupled pastry tip, that pastry tip can fly out of the bag, across the room, impale someone. So this gives you so much more control. Just make sure that you don't have like really bits, for instance, in this case, this was a strawberry pastry cream. I added a little bit of red dye just to make it more vibrant. You don't have to. Um, so in this case, there could be chunks of strawberry in the jam. So make sure that you get a very smooth one so because that can stop up the hole. So now I want to finish up my Fraser. I have ganache for the top. Uh, I did the, a little Mother's Day tart truffle class. So if you watch the ganache part, this is the ganache and it's still very liquidy. I kept it very viscous because I have a little heating pad uh, on a chair down there so that it doesn't get overheated and split but just hot enough that it stays this consistency because it will be going on the top of my cake. And because this is another one that I made so it's nice and cold, immediately start moving this around because it sets very quickly. And that's another wonderful way of using that acetate or parchment. It will keep that ganache in place without going over the sides because we just want it sitting on the top of the cake. Come on, buddy. 
And you could use a spatula to do this, of course, but then you might get a little marred finish and I want it to be completely smooth. Come on, buddy, you can do it. So close. Got a couple bubbles, but I'm not gonna fret too much about that. It's a workout, but because I have a few bubbles, I'm gonna do this, loud noise. Ooh, get over there. And I have a little more ganache in my piping bag. And what I'm going to do, make sure that it's flowing nicely, I'm going to pipe it in circles around the perimeter, like a so. And then on top, I have strawberries that are cut right down the middle. I'll lay them like that. And this is a lovely way. I love that you can cut strawberries in so many different ways. See that? No worries there. And it creates a totally different effect. And no bit of the strawberry went to waste. When I hold the ones that went along the side, I really only took off the green parts of it, but I still fed those green parts to my hens. The little tips of these guys I kept as well because I think they're awfully sweet. And then say that, you know, that's a little imperfection, so this will go there and hide as much of it as I can. That looks a little too crowded, so I'll put that one there. Put that one there. And this over here. Always nice to have decor that can hide any imperfections. Again, because this is bothering me, I'll put this here. And that is a wild strawberry leaf, so edible, along with the wild strawberry flower. And they're everywhere in the Vermont fields right All now. All you have to do is look on the ground, and there they are. Get back up there, sir. You're so artistic, Zena. And you know, you know that's what I love is that you are putting down what you are eating. So I love that the tips of the strawberries almost look like raspberries if you're not mm. looking too closely. Um, but it also, you get the different shapes and aspects of the fruit. And you can appreciate the beauty of how it grows. So now hopefully I'll be able to unleash this puppy. Oh, stay acetate, stay. And now if I undo it, that. you can see what I was talking about, how those strawberries just line the perimeter. And that's you have so a beautiful elegant. summer cake. Yeah, that's, you have such a wonderful aesthetic. It's really, really delicate and beautiful to look at. As long as it's also tasty. I'll bet and you it I is. I love chocolate and strawberry together so much. If you find that, see here, you can see some of that frost along here indication that it is a little too cold to cut so you can nip off some of the frost so it doesn't leach into the cake and you can see I've got my cake board here so I can just move the cake at will um, but once you have gotten that frost off you can then brush <coughs> the face of the strawberry with a bit of strawberry jam mm. as a glaze but also to enhance it and also oftentimes grocery store strawberries have a very white mm -hmm. interior so it will give them a pop of color and a flavor so and you it'll get be a little bit of a and in germany often they use an apricot glaze as they do in france so you could use an apricot glaze but if you've got the strawberry jam mm -hmm. why just not go with a flavor mm -hmm. that we're working with already and i think it's a wonderful mm -hmm. way to go isn't that elegant that's so beautiful so we have a perfect summer cake for now because strawberries are coming up everywhere. So save a, little f a few of those flowers, not too many so that you get more strawberries, but enough to decorate your cake. Mm. And so that's a way of assembling with things we've already learned. And just so you know, this cake can be made gluten-free. So you just have to swap out the flour one for one for the measure for measure flour. Obviously the puff has gluten in it. You can just leave those out entirely and just make a mousse cake. The pastry cream recipe, the, per, this particular one does have some flour. You can just swap that out yeah, for the starch. rest. It just makes this, it all cornstarch. Um, so that you have a 
perfectly beautiful, tasty, gluten-free cake, and it's not one of those things that you're trying to wrangle something that's really hard, like a, a crusty bread, into gluten-free. Mm. This does it quite naturally without, yeah. you don't impair any of the flavor. It's just as beautiful, eats beautifully, um, and will look just as beautiful as well. That's great. Congratulations, it's just beautiful. Beautiful. Okay, over here, or you Are have you're, more we're over there. there. I'm right. done. We're gonna do the final shaping of these, and at some point before we're completely done, we will give another series of folds to that patiently resting dough that we just began. So here are our banneton, or broat forms. These go back, Germany is very famous. These go back to the 1980s. When I owned a bakery in southern Vermont, I used to buy these by the hundred. They come, came across the ocean from Germany in burlap bags. I love that. And it was a peasant industry. It was from Meinroth, which was a poor area, and people would go down to the river and harvest the reeds and steam them around metal forms. What kind of and reeds are they? Some kind of water reed, I'm not sure. And yeah, so one thing I've always wanted to do was learn how to make banneton. Yeah. I would love that. Anyway, where did my towel go? I can always I get you know. another one. So I'm going to flour these. Even though the seams are going to be down, you still want to have that barrier of flour. And oh, here it is. I'm going to switch this out and use this for the oval. You don't need fancy stuff. You can buy a salad bowl at the store and line it with a cloth like this. If you have these banneton, you'll use them for years and years, and you'll love them. But there's so much we can do with what's at hand. So try not to ever feel intimidated. Well, I'd love to make this, but I can't because dot, dot, dot. You probably can make it. The timer is just about to go off. So before I do this shaping, we'll take one last look here. Now, you're going to keep these breads here, so you have to tell me how you like the bake. If you like a bold bake, or if you want it a little more moderate. I like a little more bold. How's that? I'd say a few more. More? For moi. Okay. What would you do? Uh, it's, more important. I call it in the window. In the window? It can come out now. It can keep baking. Let's take it out now, because we've got room here. Okay. We can put them all here. And as we are here at the moment. Ooh. That's okay, right? Yeah, that's fine. And these are probably done. They've been about 18 minutes or so. Oh, those are lovely. That cake is... Yeah, we'll move it over. Yeah. We'll survive. It was in the freezer for I long. think those are good enough. So we can turn the oven off. Yeah. Look at all our goodies. Okay. Isn't that fantastic? Mm. You know what I have to say about this bread, too, is that the, the germ gives it a very cr gorgeously creamy yeah. color, but the texture is creamy as well. Yeah. It's beautiful, it is, right? It is. So, so you get that lovely contrast between the crispness of the crust and kind of a luxurious center. Yeah. Uh, but And it has all the beauty that you would want of a natural oven bread. It's got the lovely holes and all those things, but just the color, the cast of it is really magical. And um, I love when the breads come out and it's like this is sort of the final expression of the flower. Yes. All the labor that began with preparing the fields to plant the grain, the labor mm -hmm. is over. It's been through the farmer, it's been through and the miller, it's, it's been through the baker. <laughs> Right? It's beautiful. Yeah, it's a good feeling. Okay. Shaking. So, I'll start in a similar fashion to the way I pre-shaped it, but this time it's, this is the business end. Now we have to make sure we've got it nice and tight, no rips. That should do the trick. Now I'll invert it, put it in a damp cloth, put it in a bed of sesame, and then what I like to do, just for insurance purposes, is often it's tacky here now, and I don't want to put tackiness here, even though I've floured it. So I'll often just do that to ensure that it's not going to stick. 
So this bread can now be either proofed for one and a half to two hours, depending upon the temperature, the vigor of the sourdough, the maturity of the dough, or it can be refrigerated and baked tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And you're going to bake this bread? This is for you? Or what? We have options here. I mean, I can take it if you don't need bread, or I can leave it for you to bake. That's What's this need you speak of? Oh, want. <laughs> we'll sort this out. We'll, we'll sort, sort it, out. it out. We'll duke it out. Yeah, well, I'm sure we'll have a big controversy. Okay, and here's the oval one. And again, if you don't want the extra sesame seeds, you don't have to do it. They look lovely, though, in the finished loaf. You can see again all kinds of fermentation gases, dry hands. Dry them as often as you need to. Take it to the bottom and then just palpate it until it's got the kind of symmetry that you're happy with. If you want pointier ends, go for it. If you like it a little blunter, do it that way. There are those. So I'm going to just leave these aside. I'll cover them in a minute, but for now, I'm going to leave them aside so that I can do the next mixing of the dough, which yeah, is so over this here. Is, it has rested. How, how long would you say it's rested? It's been uh, about 35 minutes. And then I'll come back and do those breadsticks. They can wait. But this is, it definitely wants another mix now. So now it may look a little bit frightening. I mean, it looks all sagging and shiny and sticky and all that. The reason why it looks that way is because it is. <laughs> but now, after this next series of folds, it's going to start taking on a little bit of body. This is another one of the great things that I love about hand mixing is that beautiful tactile sense of the evolution of a dough beneath your hands. So I'm kind of stretching it back here and that's definitely helping with the gluten development. Actually, we have a lot of options. Bread for going to some place. Yeah. Unbaked loaves and dough. So we got a lot to talk about, ma'am. I know. The negotiations. Yeah. You can already see it firming up. Yeah. You can just see that it's no longer gloopy and just wanting to flow right. down the trough. Now it wants to stay together. Right. It's still a long way from being finished, but that's just really the first series of folds. The initial ones from 30 minutes ago, really you would just call those the gathering of ingredients. It's not really done for strength purposes. It's done just to literally do that, gather the ingredients. So every 30 minutes? Yep, every 30 hours. minutes for three hours. One thing when you've got dough on your hands, you want to be careful about getting that down the sink. It can be pretty bad for your plumbing. So you're better off flouring your hands and then just rubbing. Dry wash. Yeah, exactly. And make sure you do do it into a trash can. Because sometimes if you're doing a lot of work on your bench, it's really easy to incorporate those awful nubbins into what you're making. So make sure that it goes straight into the trash can and not onto your bench. All right, now I'll do those breadsticks. That's so beautiful. Set your station up for logical progression. I mean, you can tell without looking too hard that this would be logical progression. Shape, wet, seeds, final proof. It's like making fried chicken. Take, exactly like making fried chicken. It is. It's like making fried chicken. You want, okay. you want a decent progression. Except you always want to have one hand clean.
For these, personally, I don't like a taper at the end. I want them to be fairly much the same dimension throughout their length. Roll it in here. Roll it in your seeds. And you're rolling them all the way around in the seeds? Yeah, that's optional. It's not uncommon for them to shrink back because you've just been stretching so their gluten wants to shrink back. So if they do, don't work against the bread because you'll never win. The bread is always going to win. So what you'll do is just leave it and say, okay, I'll roll the next ones a little bit longer. And by the time I'm done with the eighth one, that first one will be nice and relaxed and I'll give it the last inch of stretching that it needs. This is mesmerizing to watch. Well, it certainly is a beautiful hand massage to yeah. work up bread. I sh I've always loved that part of it. And I get to also hear the, the song of bread, because over here I still hear crackling. Oh, do you? <laughs> That's a beautiful sight, of just the cake and then the breads in the I background. Know. That's Aren't really we lovely. So I'm going this way, quite visible, but I'm going this way too. Not as visible, but obviously important if I'm going to elongate it. You can hear my fingers going swish, swish on the bench because this is on the bench and this is on the bench the whole time. If I'm out like this, it's very, very hard to get an even shape. So by rounding your hand slightly, it's almost like a it's almost like a woodworker with a lathe, which is rounding the wood. Above all, if you're making a cake, if you're making bread, most of us these days, we're not doing it for subsistence, um, although that might be changing, but we are doing it out of the love of creating nutritious and tasty food for ourselves, for our families, for people we care about. And don't get hung up if something doesn't come out the way you want it to. You know, people say, oh my gosh, you make it look so easy. Well, I start, I've been doing this steadily since 1976. If I didn't make it look easy yet, then I obviously was in the wrong career. So if you're not where you want to be, don't worry, because one of the great aspects of baking is that it's a constant evolution, a personal evolution. And if you're so inclined, you will never run out of things to do because there are so many tributaries. Yes. You know, oh, I love French baking. Oh, cool. Look at that German stuff. Now right. I want to spend a decade doing German baking. I, I, there's always something new to learn. Always. As long as you want to. Yep. And the nice thing, too, is if you have some basic skills under your belt, you can start exploring other cultural breads and find the similarities that will really help you explore them more easily. You'll say, oh, this is very similar to this technique mm. uh, and be able to jump into it more easily. Yeah. Look at those beauties. Now, I hate being asked this question. That's what I'm going to ask you. If you had one thing on just a day where you just felt like baking, is there one thing that you would want to bake the most? No, that's, I mean, I understand the question, but it doesn't yeah. make any sense because. That's, this is, that's exactly my, right? using my <laughs> answer. You I'm different every day. You don't put the same clothes on every day. You don't eat the same thing for breakfast. Actually, yeah. I kind of do. Well, <laughs> but, there you go. But no, I don't have any one thing. It's like, the, you know, you have innumerable children and you want to visit them at different times. And I always call them my babies. I will not choose them on my babies. But yeah. it's, also, it's also, baking is very seasonal, just as cooking. Well, is. there you go. That's right. Like if you made this thing in November, then you're missing something you're about missing, the well, seasonal. And also, it's, a, it's rhubarb season, so you, and these windows are finite. And so it's like with gardening. You can just feel it coming. Yeah. Revel in the season. Yes. Yep. So, Ray, I'm going to ask you to go back to that tray with the breadstick so that I can show how easy it is for me now to stretch that one that was 
a little bit too short. Okay, so this was the first one. I said it was too short. I said, don't worry about it. Now it's fully relaxed and it's a matter of that. All done. So there's our breadsticks. And there's our shaped loaves. And here's our finished stuff. And proofing for the sticks versus the loaves. The sticks can go in the oven in 20 minutes. You want them to be on the dense side so that they're yeah. really crunchy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they'll Good. taste better. Great. So that's nice. When you're making something with lots of components, you get a snack almost immediately. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's crucial. Payback, yeah. So, so that was a nice hour, wasn't it? That was it? fantastic. And it was, we got the air conditioner going. <laughs> yeah, I think that's why. <laughs> it that was helped. no flop sweat. Yeah. Thank you for baking with us. You can get all the recipes. Just click the links and you'll be there. And next week, there's going to be a surprise. There will be a pastry product, there will be a bread product, but let's just leave it a little mysterious. There's going to be a surprise, yes. right? Mystery's good. So yeah. take care of yourself. Yeah, do. Be safe. Be well. Bake be well. happy. <laughs>